Welcome to Rational Religion, where spirituality makes sense. Today, we are going to be discussing Alexander Dugin, a public intellectual in Russia who has uh, quoted Islamic ideas several times in recent history. And we're going to be talking about that because we want to discuss the wider issue of Russia's future, its ideological future, its cultural future, and how Islam comes into that. Now, let me first introduce Alexander Dugin. He is a, um, uh, a very well-known uh, philosopher in Russia. He is probably, I would say, um, Russia's uh, most internationally recognized public in intellectual. And um, he has been, I guess, accused or has been described as being Putin's brain, uh, which is probably not really an accurate description. But I think it stems from the idea that he has uh, the Kremlin's ear. Some people say that he has certain individuals within the Kremlin, they do listen to him and his ideas. And he is uh, very influential, uh, especially amongst certain groups, both within Russia and without. So um, let's have a look at some of the tweets which he has been discussing, uh, which he has, he has put up, and uh, we'll go from there. <clears throat> this is one tweet. So this is his uh, Twitter handles. This is Alexander Dugan, AGD Chan. Um, and this is one tweet that he put out. Let's let's start with this one because he, he put this out earlier. So the first tweet he put out, which kind of caught my eye, was in, on July 4th, 2023. So he put out a tweet that says, Islamic banking in Russia is a great idea, sovereign and multipolar, highly patriotic. Usury is an absolute evil. The American poet Ezra Pound, who dedicated his magnum opus, uh, Cantos, to the destruction of interest, capital as an idea, reasoned as follows. God is eternity and time is the devil. Profiting from time is the devil's business. It's not <laughs> something that, as Muslims, we would... Um, endorse that concept actually because god says that i am, I am time. time yeah uh, time is actually an attribute of god not of the devil therefore financial capitalism is a economic state satanism uh the muslim theorists of bank islamic banking reason differently everything belongs to god and especially time well, so we got that <laughs> he who introduces interest on a loan appropriates what belongs to god for himself this is luciferian rebellion hmm. From the two different chains of inferences, we come to the overall conclusion, usury must be prohibited, the yoke of interest, slavery must be removed. This is what Islamic banking is all about. It is called Islamic, but in other contexts, it goes by other names. Douglas's social credit, Gesell's free money, that's the Austrian, etc. Yeah. In our case, Islamic banking can be called Russian monetary system because orthodoxy and to a certain extent, Christianity in general, categorically rejected usury. Perhaps we can discuss that. Yeah. Uh, Werner Stombart traces when, how, and where this prohibition began to be lifted and what it led to. And he goes on, on to say that... So, so can you just summarize what, <laughs> what is said there and then and then tell me why you think it's so significant? So it's important because basically what he's saying is, is that Islamic banking is one um, is what is a name within Islam and within Islamic uh, religion and culture, yeah. um, which actually has other, other names under other cultures and other concepts. So he's called for the Austrian... Theorist uh, Silvio you know, Gessel or Gessel, it was uh, hmm. it was his concept, and then there was Douglas's social credit. And what he's trying to say is that is that Russia should adopt effectively the principles of Islamic banking. And the principal one he highlights is the fact that um, usury is an absolute evil and should be removed from the Russian economic model. Hmm. Um, and, and this is what he wrote: so, right, Islamic banking is what he concludes on. Islamic banking thus simply reminds us of what we had but lost at some point. Contemporary Russian economist Alexander Galushka's idea of a two-cycle issue fits perfectly in this context. So, so I mean, if we... So that last line, I'm in sorry. this case, the terms Islamic and Russian coincide in meaning. Right. So what he's saying <laughs> there is that, um, the Ru basically, he's pretty openly saying that the Russians should adopt a form of Islamic banking, but yeah. call it Russian banking. Yeah. And this yeah, is yeah. this concept of a multipolarity that you can have different names for different things and sometimes different names for the same thing. Um, and that sometimes these coincide, sometimes they don't, but we should all learn from each other. And I think there's something very significant, which is that you have a top public intellectual in a modern nation openly saying that we should take something from scripture and use it as a national system. Can you see that ever happening in the contemporary West? No, because they deride religion, whereas I don't think Russians do. They kind of are proud of their orthodox Christianity. Mm. And this is what he's trying to say. He says, Islamic banking reminds us simply of what we have lost at some point. Mm. And what he's referring to there is the fact that Christianity also used to prohibit usury. Yeah. But I think, and we're going to get into this, that it's prohibited usury um, because it, at a time when it still had overtures of a Jewish faith. Yeah. And when it entirely rebelled against all roots of Judaism um, in the Protestant movement, 
in the Anglo-Saxon West. And they, then they lost all traces of the concept of religious law and with that, the concept of uh, the banishment of usury. And that especially happened, as we know, from our interview with um, uh, Tariq al Dawani. Tariq al Dawani, really, really, really good economics interview. Yeah. Um, the, he, tra he writes this book, The Problem of Interest, in which he traces the history of interest. Hmm. And he begins it really with... Um, in in ancient antiquity, but in the recent phenomenon, it's come about through. It became acceptable through Henry VIII. Yeah. So I think we will talk more about Islamic banking uh, maybe 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 later in the video yeah. because I, I wouldn't agree that you know it's everything he said is just what Christians had and we can just call it Russian. Islam is a far broader philosophy and what well, religious Extra philosophy extraordinarily than that. Uh, and developed. it has 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 much more than than the Russians have ever had or any nation has ever had. Yes, um, apart from those who did actually adopt it. But I think what you said is very true, which is that the, the Western people deride religion, whereas the Russians. <clears throat> don't seem to which is particularly remarkable given their history yeah how do you make sense of their their their, their you know harsh history of the last hundred years and their relationship with religion now i think they rebelled against everything that was communist hmm. um and part of that was a rebellion of religion and, and what was communism's relationship with religion for those who may not know well communism was uh explicitly anti-religious explicitly anti-god and then god was as fa the famous um uh you know phrase goes and i don't even know if it's accurate or not that religion is the opiate of the masses. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you're the one who's read Marx. I haven't. Yeah, <laughs> so he said that. Yeah, he said that. Right. So I, I think that um, they rebelled against communism and with everything that went with communism. And under communism, you had purges. The church was effectively a secret organization hmm. uh, in in Russia, at least, and not necessarily in all countries that were communist. Yeah. But definitely in Russia. Yeah. And it was an underground movement. Yeah. Um, and so it became mainstream. And Putin in particular has perhaps done more than any other individual, possibly in Russian history, mm. to promote, uh, to bring back Orthodox Christianity and not just Orthodox Christianity, but a concept of God yeah. back into a society um, uh, uh, from the lowest possible point, which yeah. was the early 90s. So I think it's particularly remarkable because you know um, it's not just uh, Christianity that they that they seem to have a, a, a quite positive relationship, but also the Dagestanis and the Chechnyans are very openly Muslim, yeah. and uh, the governance in in Russia seems to be quite supportive of that because especially because they know the Muslims are going to make a huge part of their population. Yeah, they're already ten percent, and it's going to be much more by by twenty thirty. Remember uh, an yeah. interview with Putin saying so. I think almost. An uncharitable view would be just be self-preservation, but I think it's actually more than that. Um, so well, what they, what they, just a quick comment on that: what they want to do and what they're trying to do is to make sure that Islam is is an is an a, that there is a Russian Islam, hmm. right? and that there's not a resentment from the Russians, correct? Like, like you have, uh, perhaps you could say in France, correct? And that's what Putin highlighted in one of his interviews. He said the Muslims in our nation are not foreigners. Hmm. Okay, you go to France, the 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 the, the Muslims are seen as as a, as an external foreign threat yeah from a separate non french culture mm. but russia uh, has uh, many ethnicities and many religions and many languages many time zones is huge so yeah. as a result the in one of them we are alive at a reasonable hour <laughs> in one of them we are alive at <laughs> i actually don't think we are i think at the moment is all nighttime in russia it's just the muslims getting up for fudger <laughs> yes yeah, fact fact so i think that um, they're trying to adopt, they're not trying to adopt Islam, but what they're trying to do is, is make sure that there is a Russian, a meaningfully Russian patriotic Islam. Yeah. Right. And I think they've achieved it, actually. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, one could even say one of the biggest contributors to this is exports. The, uh, export is the MMA. Yeah. Right. The MMA fighters mm. have kind of put Russian Muslims on the map internationally yeah. as a patriotic group. And domestically, also the Chechnyans and their the contributions Chechnyan fighters, to yeah. their to to the Ukraine war and and Mariupol fights, all this they're they're seen as heroes. Yeah, um, which is uh, which is you know you think about that relationship between the the Russian native with the they're all natives actually because it's such a big country, but let's say the white Russians. Yeah, and their relationship with the with the Muslim Russians is so much more positive than you have it basically anywhere in the Western world, as far yeah. as I can tell. Yeah, um, and let's just pause here and think about what. Russia's, what is this moment in history for Russia? Because as you said, they had a huge sweep against religion. The League of Militant Atheists was taking down, cutting down all of these religions to so that the state religion of communism and atheism yeah. was, was propped up. 
Then they had total collapse in the 1990s. The prophecy of Ezekiel actually talks about, I think it was, I can't remember the exact wording, but like, like vultures who are, who are feeding uh, on the people there. And, and we, can, uh, we can go through that in a moment. And now it seems that they are reviving religion and they are reviving their relationship with religion. Um, but there is a problem. And the problem is, is what's next? Uh, because, you know, one thing that strikes me is that Dugin and I think the Russian, um, you know, Russian uh, feeling as a whole is that they don't want to be like the West. Yeah. They, they, there, is, there is a huge resentment against the West, which has only intensified, obviously, in recent years, uh, but it's been growing for some time. And yet at the core of it, in reality, they're not actually that different in the sense that they have the same religious culture that the West had yeah. a few decades ago, 50s, 60s. You can say maybe you can locate current Russia in that time where you have generally people that are traditional and conservative. And then in the big cities, you have the, the progressive liberals who are more radical. Um, and their economic structure is essentially capitalistic with, st with some, um, you know, state socialism here and there and very strong uh, governance in the sense of a political process that has a strong arm on the country, yeah. whatever one thinks of its uh, democratic, democratic um, merits. Yeah. So it seems to me very similar to how America and Britain was a few decades ago. And yet Russia wants to escape that faith. It doesn't want to become the West. It's actually hugely against. And uh, Dugan himself talks about this. They're, 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 the public uh, opinion is very much against LGBT being kind of widely promoted against feminism, against all of these things of modern modernity and Dugan hates modernity. And yet one doesn't see a clear path forward from them. How, how do they escape the fate of the West mm. uh, is the question. Mm. Um, so any thoughts on that? Um, so, you know, there is this hyper individualism that Dugan talks about in the West. Yeah. Um, and how I think you were talking to me about it earlier that it, the liberalism of the West does not permit for any idea for any collective identity. Well, that's what Dugan says. That, yeah, that's yeah. what Dugan says. Yeah. Um, beyond that of um, because the individual has become such a prominent focus and a center of all of the of all of Western ethics hmm. that uh, there's no there's no kind of space hmm. for other cult, other identities. And for Dugan, I think the main one is a national identity. Hmm. Um, to the extent that the individualism, the hyper-individualism of the West is exported, hmm. seeks to be exported to other nations such that, and, and it's done under the guise of human rights and it's done under the guise of um, uh, the rights of the individual, hmm. not bearing into mind the rights of the community. Yeah. Not bearing in rights, in a way, sense for what Dugan believes is the rights of the nation. Yeah, and right. how different people may have a different view on rights and responsibilities. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, the LGBT issue is a really good one. It's not the only one, but it's a really good one to kind of show as an example, hmm. which is that the view of the West is that a person individually has the right to love who they want and sleep with who they want and so on and so forth. And the Russian view is, or this, the Dugan's Russian view, which is kind of the majority view, hmm. is that a person does have those rights to individually do what they want, Mm. But they also have a responsibility to their society mm. uh, not to undermine the society's progress toward the continuation of this, the, that particular ethnic group, mm. right? And if you therefore promote... And I, also traditional values, and tradi the moral fabric. Yeah, but the traditional values and all that, it's all about, it's all geared towards producing the next generation of citizens, mm. right? Um, and the LGBT movement, because of its focus upon personal uh, choices of... Uh, sexual orientation or personal feelings of sexual orientation. Yeah. Um, instead of the responsibility of the individual to the collective community to produce children yeah. and to produce families, mm. right? Which, you know, I mean, people could argue that gay people can still have children. One could argue that they can't actually, you know, a gay man has to have an artificial insemination process to have a child. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the other man it still it, requires an uh, essentially heterosexual process. It's an artificial heterosexual process, right? Mm. So, you know, basically that scene, LGBT issues are seen as a threat to Russian national identity because it will undermine traditional values which seek to promote a, the next generation of Russians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So that's that's one example, that's one aspect of it, but there's lots of others. Um, 
and, and can I can I just come in there, which is that you know, this is what Dugan rallies against, which is that he says he's not personally particularly animated against uh, homosexuals or or feminists, etc. Yeah. But what he says is that Western liberalism has a totalizing aspect; it's totalitarian. Yeah. It wants to invade other people's borders and invade other people's uh, cultures um, and promote itself as the master ideology. And he hates that. He's like viscerally hates that. Actually, if you, if you watch his his stuff and you read some of his work. Um, and he says that's not acceptable. Different people have their own different moral values, and they have a right to choose what goes on in their uh, nation. And for him, the nation is kind of the real, the real unit or that of sovereignty. Um, so you know, it's a very interesting analysis. Um, I think one which many you know Muslims actually probably across the world would would uh, would agree with. Um, but let's let's return now to this essential question of how does Russia escape? the fate of the West. Because as we said, they are in essentially a very similar position. And for Russians, including Dugin, to think that they will somehow automatically get out of that, you know, escape trajectory. And 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 uh, I don't know if I use that phrase right, but it sounded <laughs> cool. If they'll get out of that trajectory of ending up in an atheistic, uh, hyper-liberal, hyper-individualistic, um, uh, pop, you know, uh, nation, seems a bit naive. But in order for us to prove that case that we are putting forward, which is yeah. that the natural evolution of an orthodox Christian society is towards a liberal individualistic uh, society, we have to show our working for that. So what is it about Christianity that we would say necessarily leads to the world that we have today in the West? I think that the... Um the that's your question to me i guess yes right <laughs> opposed to jim jim no we'll go to go to you first um i think the key thing is is that the you know what christianity actually is hmm. um and what christianity actually is is a religion like none other right um people might think that all religions are the same and you know they're all just the same but actually they're actually quite fundamentally different yeah and christianity is actually a standout religion yeah in a completely a different different way hmm. right uh, and the way that it's a different religion in actual fact is that it's premised on an anti-religious philosophy oh okay now you wouldn't actually you know christianity that, is based on anti-religious philosophy yes yeah, so it's quite the claim it's, it's animated by uh, you know saint paul in particular is possibly the the founder of modern christianity okay okay um, we're gonna have to unpack that but okay let's carry let's go on with it for now so so you, you know, when you look at the doctrines of Christianity, they're all from Romans, Corinthians, Galatians. They're all from the writings of St. Paul. Hmm. Okay. And what, what Paul did, what Jesus was a, a, a Jewish teacher. He was hmm. a Jewish prophet. And his role was, is he saw it to revive the Jewish nation principally and bring them back to the Torah. So he made it very explicit. You know, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Right. All of the doctrines... Can you repeat that for me? I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So which law is he talking about there? The, the Jewish law. Okay. Right? And he himself was a practicing Jew. He taught Judaism. Okay? Mm -hmm. So what St. Paul did, and he created a, 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 a religion out with Jesus as its central point, um, and he used the cover of Jesus' moral majesty to infiltrate uh, Christianity with a um, an anti-God, anti-religious notion that the law of Judaism is a curse. Right. Right. So he taught the, 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 that the law of Judaism is a curse and Christ has liberated us from the curse of the law. The idea was that if you commit any sin or any kind of, um, you know, uh, crime against God, any sin, hmm. then that makes you eternally punishable. Okay. Right. You know, in the eyes of Was that Jesus? Was that, that Jesus' that, view? That wasn't Jesus' view. I mean, it's basically something he made up. Yeah. Um, and St. Paul effectively uh, therefore said that because God is so holy and he cannot tolerate any sin, even though he permits it to exist, he, <laughs> you know, I mean, he cannot tolerate any sin whatsoever. Consequently, um, the law in itself is in actual fact a curse. Yeah. Right. It's like basically saying that we shouldn't have laws in a country because people might break them. And therefore, the problem isn't that people are breaking them. The problem is that we have a law in the first place. Right. It's an extremely perverse way of looking yeah. at the concept of rules in life. Yeah. Okay. So he believed and he said that the law is a curse and Christ has liberated us from the law. In other words, by Christ's death on the cross for us, mm. he has taken the burden of sins upon himself. 
such that we do not need to, not such that we are liberated from the punishment of our own sins. Yeah. Okay. So now we don't need to follow the law because all of the possible ways we could have broken the law and all the sins we would have committed. Yeah. They've all been taken by Jesus. So that's why Christians don't get circumcised. That's why Christians don't, uh, they eat pork. They eat pork they drink. That's why they, you know, yeah. they don't follow any of the, the laws of Judaism modern day. Mm. Um, and that's been the case from pretty much day dot with respect to Paul's followers. So Paul spread in Europe and he spread um, effectively from, from Judea West. Mm. But Jesus' mm. actual mission and message actually spread from Judea East throughout Asia. And it was the Asians who accepted a Judaic form of Christianity. And this difference between Paulinism and Jesus's original message is seen best in Acts, in Acts 21, where James, the apostle of, of Jesus, he says to Paul in the temple, he said, you've come from, uh, from your tours and your trips. And um, we have heard that you've been teaching men everywhere against um, the traditions of their fathers, fathers and against the law of Moses, yeah. and that there are Jews who have believed. In other words, Jews who are followers of Jesus, who are from Asia, mm. and they have heard, they are here in Jerusalem, and they will surely hear that you have come. Yeah. So take these three men who are like you and shave their your heads and carry out the Nazarite. Period. When they rioting, essentially. No. So this is what they he told he told Paul to repent of modern day Christian doctrines in Acts twenty one. Clearly written there. And when he repented, uh, then he took those men and he repented. Mm. He spent three days in the temple. He carried out what's known as the Nazarite purification rituals. And on the third day, those Jews from Asia who had believed in Jesus, they were followers of Jesus, but they were Jews. They found him in the temple. They mobbed him. And the police, the, Ro the Roman police had to arrest him, mm. arrest Paul for his own safety. Right. Christians always make out like it was the Jews who opposed Jesus, who who had Paul, uh, who mobbed Paul, mm. because Paul was just such a a great ap apostle. Mm. Okay, it wasn't that at all. Yeah, I mean, it's explicitly. It says not explicitly that. the Jews who have believed, mm. they shall surely hear that you are come, and they're enraged with you. So, so the, the 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 arrest of Paul was about Paul's insult to Jesus's Jewish followers. Yeah, and his actual Jewish message. Right. So Paul hijacked. Um, uh, Jesus's message to pervert it from within to create an anti-Jewish um, uh, religion by mm. which Jews should be so offended and disgusted with mm. uh, through the placement of Jesus as its central figure as the physical son of God such that uh, they would reject it outright. He was a Pharisee uh, hypocrite plant within the Jews, uh, the Jesus's Jewish movement. Yeah, And so what I'm trying to get to here is that that's just a bit of history, but really what I'm trying to get to is that Paul founded a religion which spread in the West, which is founded upon the abolition of law mm. and the concept that the lawgiver and the law itself and the concept of law is evil, yeah. that rules are evil, mm. okay? That actually you need to break free of rules. Yeah. So he was the first pure anarchist and his anarchy was conducted not and directed not at the state, not mm. at the national culture, not at the laws of the land, but at the lawgiver against God. The mm. idea that um, that the law that God has given is actually a curse, which is such a perverse thing to say, because the one who gives you the law, for the law to be a curse, it must mean that the lawgiver is a curse. Mm. So he's calling God Satan. He's call, he calling God Satan. And what comes from God is satanic. Mm. And then claiming that God himself sacrificed himself or his son to save mankind from his own actions. And that suicide is purified and sanctified as being a, a wonderful action, even though it is always known as a satanic action. Yeah. And the giving of a law is, is, called, uh, is called a curse. Yeah, it's like following up, it. up is down and down is up. And, so, and, and so, can, I, can I just mention, because people may ask, well, how do we know that, you know, um, Jesus... People may ask, you know, how do we know that Jesus actually um, didn't believe in, uh, in this same thing? And it's very simple. The Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. Yeah. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil directly. Uh, and then a bit later, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father, Father will also forgive you. So if you are good to others, God will forgive you. Yeah. So there is forgiveness baked into Jesus' teaching. It's not just here. It's throughout the Jewish law, which, which Jesus himself espoused. So Jesus was very, very straightforward and, and clear. Just going back to what you said, though, you know, so forgive us, our, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, what's the nature of our forgiveness of other human beings? Does it involve 
It doesn't involve, it doesn't involve me punishing a third person. Or punishing yourself. Yeah, no. No, so forgiveness is not an act of self-flagellation. No, there's no, there's no, nothing is punished. Nothing That's is punished. That's the essence of forgiveness. Yes, exactly. It's the waving of punishment. Yeah. Whereas in, in the Christian philosophy or Pauline philosophy of God's so-called forgiveness, it's not that he's forgiven anything. Yeah. It's that he's conducted the punishment upon Jesus. Okay. So it's simply that punishment has been enacted. So nothing is forgiven. Okay. Now, what you mentioned there is that in the, for the Asians, I mean, this is Ahmadiyya kind of... Um, uh, the Ahmadiyya interpretation of events, which we believe is is thoroughly well historically documented, mm. and Ahmadiyya is the the strand of Islam to which we belong. Yeah. Islam Ahmadiyya, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and um, what uh, what we put forward as being well evidenced both scripturally and historically is that Jesus went east. He preached unto the lost tribes of the house of Israel, and they believed in him, and they became Messianic Jews. They became um, they became Jews who believed in the Messiah. Yeah. And we know that they later, when Islam came, m you know, many to most to all of them converted to Islam. Islam because it was baked into that teaching that there would be that prophet, yeah. you know, the uh, the paraclete who would come and whose message that they cannot yet hear. So what hear. you're saying is that, that Jesus actually survived the crucifixion yeah. and then migrated in search of the lost tribes of Israel. Yeah. And that those followers who accepted Jesus' Judaism became mm. Muslim. Yeah, and now we have a whole video on that. Um, That's a lot which, of we've just sent, we just <laughs> we just done a brain dump on the audience. And they're like, oh my goodness. Well, we, we've covered this several times. So we, we've yeah, covered we this in a, one especially called The Intelligent Design of Jesus' Crucifixion. Yeah. Um, I think it's called that. And there was another one which you did uh, at the beginning of the Rational Legend uh, podcast that yeah. we had uh, back in the COVID dates. Yeah. So one can go and check those out. But the long and the short of it is that you had the kind of East <laughs> after twenty minutes. The long and the short of it is is that the Eastern um, uh, believers in Jew in, in Jesus became uh, later Muslim, and they were basically Jews who believed in the Messiah. And the remaining ones in Europe um, and Rome onwards, that's where the church, which was based on Paul, yeah. was uh, perpetuated. Yeah. So then you have the Catholic Church is there. Yeah. So why don't you walk us through a bit? the Catholic Church and how they held things together and then the role of Protestantism in the West and whether Protestantism was false as the, as the, as the Orthodox Christians believe yeah. or not. So, so Catholicism, you know, how do you found a religion and maintain social cohesion on the notion that uh, the law is a curse? Hmm. Very difficult <laughs> because you, you there are rules. Isn't they cursed? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so if, if the premise is that the law is a curse, where does the social order come from? Mm. Because no 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 civilization can be built on lawlessness. Mm. So what the church did is it supplanted uh, uh, Jesus' Judaism and the Torah and the laws of Moses. It supplanted them with obedience to the church. Mm. The church became the foundation of a new law and the church became the new law giver. Mm. Okay. And it believed that explicitly. That's what the Catholics believed explicitly. Mm. Okay. And so Catholicism created a new religion based on rules. For example, the notions of uh, uh, a simple one is uh, the idea of confession. Mm. Okay. That through confession, your sins are forgiven. Okay. Mm. That has no place in Judaism whatsoever. None whatsoever. In Judaism, if you confess your sins, you've actually committed a crime. You mean publicly to others? Publicly, yeah, to others. Spreading them. Yeah, by spreading them. It's actually a crime because you've opened society to your evil. What you should do is go into seclusion and beg God for forgiveness and let him forgive you, mm. right? But confession is their, their confession to God becomes confession to the church. In other words, the church has supplanted God. It's mm. taken over the role of God. So, so Catholicism created a new um, architecture of rules mm. um, based upon obedience to itself, mm. Okay. And the Latin law that was being promulgated in all the churches across Europe, which none of the ordinary people could understand, mm. okay, became the basis of that faith. Okay? Right. So when the printing press came along, when the Bible was then translated, and the Germans in particular started reading mm. all of the this. The engines of social change. The in engines Europe. of social change <laughs> in Europe are the Germans. You know, very ideologically fixated as a nation. In general, I would say, actually. Yeah, and that can be their great advantage in the future It can be a great well. advantage if they ob obtain a good ideology, but it's been quite bad in the past, apparently. No, mm. no, absolutely. Mm. It's been quite very bad when they become ideologically fixated on other things. Um, but 
in, in and, the, and the Protestant movement came out of them mm. because they started reading the Bible and they started reading that actually there's no meant the church doesn't feature. Yeah. Right. You know, you could possibly interpret a few things here and there in terms of the reference to church, Peter and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, they've got a huge religion that they're living under, which is the church. But when they read the book, there's nothing mentioned about church. In fact, it's all Paul saying, you know, the law's a curse. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so then they basically said they became ultra Paulinists. Yeah. To rebel again, but this time not against God, but against the church. So yeah. then they used Paul's writings against the church. Right. Against the church rules. So it was Paulinism redux. It was. And this was actually prophesied by the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Okay. Because he said that Satan will remain chained for 1,000 years. Mm. Right. And 1,000 years after the prophet Muhammad, who, what was it? That's when um, Protestantism began. And it was well, that. Pro- that's when it spread. That's least. when it's. Well, no, it's where it began, even the, the 16th century in the 15th, mm. 15th, 16th century. That's when it began. Mm. Um, so you have the birth of of Protestantism, Protestantism hmm. and that actually enabled imperialism. Right. It was, it was Protestantism in particular that fueled the ideological basis of liberalism. Right. In actual fact, the idea and the focus upon, of, of the individual's rights hmm. uh, over others. Now, liberalism is very interesting because it was tied into imperialism as well. Yeah. So what the liberals like, uh, you know, John Stuart Mill, they they were liberal for their own upper class wealthy British people. Yeah, while defending while the, defending the, the while, while but they're literally defending for him the British East India Company in uh, in Parliament. I think it was in Parliament or courts, and at least many parliamentarians thought this this was absolutely ridiculous for him to be defending this company that even they at that point thought were totally um, out of bounds. Yeah, uh, but his books were very nice. Yeah, exactly. So so he this was the problem. This was the conundrum with liberalism, which is that. They espoused the importance of hyper individualism and they used it as a means to subjugate nations mm. and ignore now, how did their, they do hyper- I don't, I don't fully, their individualism. What, what, can you make that link more explicit? How did it motivate um, the imperialism as such? Well, well, because Protestantism is the foundation of liberalism, which is the idea, well, there's a religious aspect to that, mm. which is that God has forgiven your sins. Okay. Right. Now, if God has forgiven your sins and there's no moral. Yeah, at least with Catholicism, you still had the notion of of obligation and accountability to the church. Hmm. When that's gone, hmm. you don't have any obligation or accountability to anyone, hmm. and the emphasis is placed upon Jesus's death for the sins for your sins. Mm-hmm. Then ultimately, it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. And then it becomes a question of how can I utilize my resources to benefit myself? And liberalism, in a way, was a I see it as um, a a um, a pseudo justification, right? A political justification for the crimes of imperialism. Okay. Right. Which is that I should be able to do what I want because it, the emphasis was upon the individual's rights. Right. That nobody can curtail my rights. Yeah. Right. To do what I want. Now, the- so actually, it was the loss of a restraining factor. Yeah. Is that is that what you mean? Because we can say that Protestantism, because of, because it it redoubled. Or rather, it uh, revisited Paul's emphasis on the fact that there are no rules, yeah, and you are forgiven whatever you do. Yeah, the natural mor- moral instincts that one has, as well as whatever rules you may have had from the church and even the bureaucracy of the church, which may or may not condone certain political actions. Yeah, suddenly all those things go away. Yeah. so you lose the restraining factor, while you have a um, your natural instincts as a, as an individual, and then that turns into communities and nations. They want to their natural instincts are now uh, unrestrained to go and conquer. And as the technology improves, they go and do that, and it can all be done in the name of Christ as well. Yeah, because absolutely. there's and it nothing, was. and it yeah. was explicitly. And there's nothing which there's nothing which they can say from the scripture stops that because well, Paul Paul said that the law is a curse. So so basically, it was. It's all, it's almost like atheism in a way, isn't it? It is. It is because it it, it uses Christianity to do away with God. Yeah, well, it uses Jesus. <laughs> it uses in Jesus his name. to do away with God the Father, the one to whom you'll be held accountable. Hmm. Um, and certainly, you know, liberalism it did bring with it certain. Uh, it brought a heightened consciousness of individual rights. Yeah, which played an important role in British law abroad. Yeah, and enforcing individual rights. And in tipping the balance in societies where individual rights were subjugated to the community completely, yeah, 
then it helped push that back yeah. and created a kind of a moderate, it was a moderating factor in those societies. And the biggest one is, you know, that comes to mind is India. Yeah. Right. So the Sikh rule and the, um, the Sikh rule at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, and how it had oppressed the Muslims yeah. in the Punjab, for example, we know best, um, such that Muslims were not permitted to do the call to prayer. They were not permitted to uh, exercise their normal religious rights under pain of death often. Um, the consequence of the British coming there mm. and the focus on individual rights, mm. right, was that everybody had freedom of religion. Yeah, the freedom of religion became baked into the society of India. So it had positives as well, mm. but it was also used for negatives. Yeah, and those positives are, as you say, very significant, positive, sig very significantly positive. But it's almost like, um, yeah, they they lost the, the the religious aspect. Just kind of became it just opened it up. So as society developed intellectually, anyway, yeah, um, and as sort of public morality in some respects improved then they were able to implement that. And as public morality or governmental morality in some respects reduced, they were also able to implement that. Yeah. So we should never kind of wholly condemn, I no, think. No, we shouldn't. Um, that, Liberalism that. is not e an evil in 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 all its aspects. Hmm. And we shouldn't be absolutists and not recognize the very significant good that the West achieved hmm. um, through its imperial projects. Hmm. That's a fact. Now, anybody who thinks that um, the development of concepts of individual lot rights would have take would have been just happened automatically without mm. the the role of the British Empire is deluded. Mm. The, the reality is is the role the British Empire conquered vast swathes of nations, cu cu countries, and territories, mm. and uh, and put in place legal systems in those countries that persist to this day, mm. right, in which individual rights are protected. Okay, but that's interesting because. One, in a way, can see that as also a phase and liberalism itself is evolving. Because if we are saying that Paulinism is like this universal acid against any rules and regulations, and it cut away at um, general societal uh, restraints and religious restraints in particular, then it becomes something which continues to burn. And how do you feel that that has continued to burn uh, in, in, in Western culture? It's an interesting point. I mean, from a medical perspective, you put talk about it as acid, and it's kind of true, actually. You know, this is a bit disgusting, but it just reminds me of it, so I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> Too late, my inhibitions are going down. You know, when somebody ingests acid, that's what happens, actually. Mm. So the burn continues for weeks. Right. And it continues to burn through the tissues. Mm. Um, and, and actually, that's absolutely right. That's exactly what's happened with Paulinism, which is that it started... It burned the church first. It burned the church. <laughs> Well, it burned Judaism mm. first. Right, yeah, yeah, that's right, of course. Yeah. Then it burned the church with Catholicism mm. when the church built up a notion of laws all over again. And then Paul came and when the rediscovery of Paul by the Protestants burned the church big time. Yeah. Right. And then and, what And that created some intellectual headroom for things to develop. To Absolutely be it did, because it freed man from, from the yoke of the church as well. Yeah. Right, because the church had been an intellectually stifling, and from the Bible, and from the and from the Bible's literalism, which the which well, the, Catholic, the Catholics had a nuanced um, view of some some literal chapters, but at the end of the day, it reduced belief in um, uh, in the church's association with scripture, with Aristotelianism, which uh, freed people uh, scientifically to move forward. Yeah, so so that gave headroom. That was catchy, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it gave gave people headroom. It. It also, on the flip side, you know, was the ideological basis of imperialism. Yeah. But that had some upsides for the nations that were conquered to some extent insofar as their legal systems and were codified in terms... Of, and the freedom of religion. freedom yeah. of religion was enshrined in certain parts. But then what happened was, was that with World War I, and this is really where it actually comes to a head, what, what actually broke, I think, the West was the... And which transformed its um, Pauline aspects from a religious to a cultural position was the war, was World War One, World War Two, right? And as a result of that, because they lost their material power, specifically talking about Britain here, hmm. because they lost their material power and authority after World War One, then after World War Two, for sure, Suez Crisis, hmm. you you had a decline in uh, Christianity, yeah. right? 
Um, and but the 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 underlying um, philosophy hmm. of Paulinism in liberalism continued to play a part in effectively liberating um, the West from existing power structures. Right. Right. So that became initially the family. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it ma manifested in the feminist movement. Mm. Right. It manifested. Um, How did it manifest in the feminist movement? Well, the feminist movement teaches, again, you know, people think that transgenderism is like, you know, a lot of people like transgenderism, you know, where does it come from? Mm. It actually comes from a long trajectory, mm. which actually dates all the way back to feminism. Mm, at least. At least. In the cultural sphere. Yeah, in the cultural sphere. Um, so feminism teaches that, you know, men and women don't actually have separate roles, that the roles are what you choose them, mm. right? Homosexuality then teaches, or the LGBT movement builds or built on that. And in the early days, the LGBT movement and the um, the feminist movement were indistinguishable. Right. Okay. They were indistinguishable. The same people would be advocating for both. Yeah. Okay. And the LGBT movement deliberately took the lessons of the feminist movement and and used them. And now the transgenderism movement is using the same lessons that were learned from the lesbian mm. gay rights movement. You know, feminism began with the issue of roles and blurring mm. of roles. LGBT, LGB movement began with uh, blurring of sexual function. Mm. And then the T movement has gone on to biological function. <laughs> yeah. Has become more and more literal. Yeah. Right. Uh, to the extent that now the, the, the feminists are yeah. arguing with the transgender movement. Yeah. <laughs> because the biological um, blurring actually destroys the basis of feminism. Right. Because for, for feminism, Females have to exist. Yeah. So the idea, <laughs> the idea is that the idea is that that's that, like an inherent premise. The idea is that females are different to men, but they're equal and yeah. they do the same roles. They can yeah. do the same roles. That's what feminism is. Yeah. And, and early, early, we should say because there'll be people in our comments, which there always are. Early way, like the first wave of of feminism, just lay common emphasis, sense. Lay yeah, yeah. emphasis on the equality, and then the the, the later wave, second, correct, third yeah. onwards, laid emphasis on equal roles. Yes, correct. So we're not really talking about first in a sense. Yeah. But Paulinism then destroyed, um, and this underlying character, I think what happens is it became a character of the nation of the West. Mm. It was no longer a religion or a culture, even. it was a character mm. of uh, individualism first, mm. right? And of individual rights first. Individual rights in the sense of, if I feel it, I should do it. In the sense of that, there should be nothing restraining me, right? Well, that there's no. Well, yeah. So you you have it's really complex, I think, because yes, there's the character of the nation, which is of promoting individual rights, mm. and then that comes along with the breakdown of religion of the mm. church. You have the breakdown of the family, mm. right? You even have the breakdown of communities with mm. Thatcher, okay? And then you're not you're not really beholden to anyone. So instinct becomes your god. Yeah, so you are only you. You're an individual island. Yeah. Right? You have no responsibilities to your road, to your community, to your church, to your family, because they don't exist anymore. Mm. Right? And because they don't exist, then there is only you. You are an individual island. Mm. Um, you see this especially with, with young people when they go to university, I think. Mm. Um, they have no ties to anything, and they become kind of just... Exp they just seek to try new things as a manifestation of who am I right. to discover who they are, <laughs> which is, you know, I always thought it was bizarre yeah. because you, you know, what's that basically saying is, is that, um, the, the individual has to, in a way, go through lots and lots of experiences to discover who they are instead of recognizing who they are and then going and living their life. Well, and more than that, I think it's this idea that we are, um, that your, yourself has to be excavated, um, through the, through, through experience and through pleasure, which is, yeah. And through, so basically like there is this secret you, which is just so unique compared to everyone else in the world. And in order to find that you have to do the exact same as everyone else, just party hard, <laughs> drink hard, sleep with these people, yeah. and then you'll find you. Yeah. Whereas what you should do from a rational perspective is who do I want to be? Yeah. What values should I adopt? Yeah. What beliefs do I think are true? And then after that is settled, one can think about more, how do I live that? And how do I um, create myself in that persona, in that role? 
uh, through my actions. Yeah. But it takes it backwards. You yeah. know, it goes, let's do a bunch of actions first, which happen to be completely hedonistic. And then you'll find out that you are the same as everybody else. Yeah. Uh, and in your society right now. And the same equivalent person 10 years before or 10 years after will be the same as people in their generation. Yeah. So, I mean, I personally think it's Protestantism and Paulinism in particular hmm. that continues to manifest itself in this age and which has actually driven out Judaism, the church, the Catholic church. It's now even driven out the Protestant church. Right. Yeah. Even the, the Protestant church didn't write any rules. Yeah. But it's now just a figure of authority. Yeah, it is. And so itself. it must be banished. The church is the Protestant church the has Protestant eaten itself. The church has eaten itself. Yeah. Right. And and the funny thing is they don't really un get it. That's why they keep on trying to change their position. Yeah. <laughs> they don't understand that no, you need to now stand for something. Mm. Right? Because what you've been doing up to this point which is changing yourself, mm. that's what's caused your death. Yeah. <laughs> right. So anyway, the um I think what's really being felt by Russia is that they do not want to go the way of the West, but they don't know what the problem is with the West. They haven't got the diagnosis. They, they, they see the symptoms, right? Yeah. But they don't know what the diagnosis is. And yeah. so they, you know, they think that this guy is really ill. Yeah. This guy is sick. Yeah. But they don't really know what infectious disease he's caught. Yeah. And they're, they're wary of catching that disease hmm. because they can see that they might be going the same way. They've got a fever and they've got some lumps here and there. Yeah. You know, bubonic plague style. Yeah. But they don't actually know what it is. Okay. And I think that this is Alexander Dugan's problem. He's continually emphasizing multipolarity mm. because he really doesn't want to be the same as the West. No, and, and quite reasonably. So what we are saying then, we'll make it explicit one last time, is that the essence... I think we've of, made it. No, I feel we should recapitulate <laughs> just in case, which is that Paul said that the law is a curse and that freedom from the law, which was religious law, has been a universal acid which has burnt through all the layers of Western society and has led us now to seeking freedom from even biology. Yeah. And that this is what the Russians have rallied against uh, more than any other, uh, we can say, white nation. Yeah. Um, and they are finding a way... White nation! <laughs> <laughs> And that they are finding a way um, out of this. Yeah. Or they're trying to find a way out of this. And, and this actually, to me, ties very well back into Dugan. Because Dugan is famous for what he calls uh, is the fourth political theory. Yeah. And he says there have been three major political theories of modernity, which he rallies against. The first is liberalism, which we've been discussing at length. And then you have, I don't know which, in which order, I think it's fascism, then communism. And he says that fascism and communism failed because they failed to displace um, liberalism. Uh, liberalism. Liberalism won. But there now has to be a force. Well, that's because fascism and communism were, were worse than liberalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> By a long stretch. Yes, he, he, he doesn't agree with that, but I, I don't agree with his disagreement. I mean, it's um, quite, I think it's quite obvious that yeah. both of those were more absolutist. Yeah, yeah, and more unnatural and more, uh, more oppressive. I mean, if liberalism was worse, it wouldn't, you know, it's the funny thing is that when, that when diseases are worse, they kill the host faster. Yeah. Right. Liberalism has been around for a lot longer than fascism survived and a lot longer than communism survived. Yeah. Uh, and the reason is, is because it's a longer lasting. It was like SARS and I think, was it Ebola that had an insanely high death rate? Such yeah. That and then it burned spread. itself out, you know. So it's... And COVID was in that unfortunate kind of sweet spot between lethality and spreading. Yeah. It's got to, it's got to, it's got to, it's got to keep the host alive long enough for it to spread. Yeah. Right. If it kills the guy the moment it touches them, then it ain't going to go anywhere. Yeah. And um, yeah. So it's a bit like a, I don't know if we're going to go down the medical route. It's a bit like a fungus, hmm. a really, you know, an athlete's foot that just won't go away. <laughs> yeah. it recurs every summer. Right. I don't speak from experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so that's what liberalism is. But, you know, fascism it was just gangrene. Yeah. The whole foot had to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Communism was like, I don't know, really bad cellulitis. Yeah. You know, immediately skin, 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 skin lymphedema infection. and skin infection. And, and and I think you know let's let's can the audience tell that we're two doctors? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm sure they can. Well, maybe uh, let's let's pause on that for a moment because I think there's one actually, one other thing which is worth making explicit here, which is that in the prophecy of Ezekiel, yeah, um, Do the, you bring it up. Yes, the prophecy of Ezekiel, which is remarkable. And we've done a video on this before. If you check out our video um, called um, something about World War Three. Stop World War Three. Hashtag Stop World War Three. Yeah, and uh, it goes through the ca the caliph's warnings. And that's the caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So do check that video out. Uh, and we go through this in detail. We're going to briefly mention it here, which is that the prophecy of Ezekiel 
talks about the future of this time, about Gog and Magog, of Ya'juj and Ma'juj in Islamic terminology. Yeah. And why don't you walk us through some of the salient features? We don't have to go through the whole thing, but if you could summarize. Sure. Can you, can you see my share screen? Yeah, let's get it up. Thanks. Zoom in. That's perfect. I'll zoom in. That'll, that'll be me. Um, so let's, oh, where's it gone? There we go. Okay, so this is Ezekiel chapter 38, and very significantly, this is actually discussed at the end of a book called The Economic System of Islam, and that ties in very nicely with what Dugan was talking about, hmm. which is that, um, and we can come back to that actually. So this is Ezekiel chapter 38, and it's at the end of this book because actually this prophecy is about uh, two economic systems. Hmm. It's about capitalism and communism. Hmm. And civilizations, anyway. civilizations, which are described as uh, Gog and Magog. So Gog is um, Russia was Soviet, was communism. And how do we know that? Well, because it says here, and thus and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, which the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in particular I think highlighted. It's the no, this promise side, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community mm. highlighted and stated that this was actually oh, was it? Moscow and Tobolsk. Mm. Yes. Um, and God says, I'm against thee because communism was an explicitly anti-religious philosophy. Mm. But Magog, which is capitalism, is not explicitly anti-religious. So we'll get to Magog in a bit. Yeah. But the focus of Ezekiel is actually on Gog. And that means that God would himself destroy it. Right. And what that really means is that God would destroy it without any war. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way when God destroys something, it's uh, it's it's far more subtle and beautiful. Mm. It destroys it from within. Mm. Um, you know, but humans we create a lot of mess, a load of mess. But yeah. communism was destroyed from within because of its inherent failures, uh, which and, God brought to light, basically. And and what in Ezekiel tells us that it is an anti-God. Well, God says, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief mm. prince of Moscow and Tobolsk, Meshech and Tubal. And God says, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Dogorma. Mm. So amazing. <laughs> of the north quarters and all his bands of the north quarters, again, mm. it's in the northern regions. Their alliance with Iran. And Persia, exactly. Yeah. And then and then it goes on and says, Many a days thou shalt be visited, and the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. So mm. the children of Israel, it doesn't refer to literally the descendants of Jacob. So not talking about the Jews. Here. No, it's talking about people who are who are God's people. It's mm. talking about people who are religious, people who are belong to God. Mm. It means that uh, this nation, this this Soviet system would be against uh, religiosity itself, against belief in God itself. And it says, um, how does it end? How does it, how yeah, do, what does so it say how, the end is of these systems? <laughs> yeah. So it says, thus saith the Lord God, it shall come past at the same time. Shall the, thou shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I'll go to them that are at rest that dwell safely. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take a spoil and to take a prey. It's about the spread of communism. Mm. And then it says, therefore, son of man prophecy and say unto Gog, um, thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? It goes on and on. Right, and it says, finally, it says, right, I've got it. So I've been finding it, I found it. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come up against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Hmm. So God says, when you take your arms against God himself and against his people, hmm. right, then God will defend them. Hmm. For in my jealousy and the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And it says, And I will call for a sword against him, Gog, throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And he goes on to say, um, I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, mm. and will cause thee to come up from the north part, <clears throat> and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thou bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine iris to fall out of thy right hand. And so God basically says, I will destroy it, and yeah. I will leave only a sixth of its nation. Mm. And that's pretty much what happened at the end of communism. Mm. God destroyed communism himself yeah. and left it a barren waste. And its economic power hugely declined, and Massively. it lost its um, much of its uh, military prowess for sure. Yeah. And many of the countries which, which kind of helped and armed it 
yeah. um, it lost those as well. And was there something also about the vultures and how they, uh, I can't remember the exact what phraseology. Yeah, it says, I'll give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Which what's, is what's your interpretation? Well, of that? It, my interpretation is just interpretation is that that perfectly describes the '90s in Russia, yeah. where you had all of these um, capitalistic vultures yeah. from both abroad, from America and the West, and also those within Russia who came and did devour all of the um, state, yeah, all of the, the state owned, previously state owned projects and um, services yeah. of of Soviet Russia, and yeah. you know the the suicide rates of that of that time in Russia were huge. Yeah. I mean, it was just desolation across the entire nation. Yeah. Um, so this was a, a calamity for the Russian people. And it's because the system under which they lived was one in which, um, which was against God. So, th- you know, Dugan has to admit, well, on our analysis, at least, mm. doesn't have to do anything. But we, we, we would suggest that, you know, communism was a far worse evil, far worse evil. And you know the, the the prophecy of Ezekiel doesn't set doesn't at all condemn Magog in the same way, does it? No, it's almost it's like it's almost, almost absent. Well, it is almost absent, but I mean the whole of chapter thirty eight and then going into chapter thirty nine is about Gog, about how God, yeah. God will destroy the communist system. <laughs> yeah, and then it's almost a throwaway comment about Magog. Mm. It says, "Oh, and I will send a fire on Magog, yeah. and among them that dwell carelessly in the islands." <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and they shall know that I am the Lord. <laughs> and, 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 right, right. So he will, God will establish His sovereignty amongst, over Magog amongst, as well, amongst those who deny capitalism, it. specifically yeah. those that dwell carelessly in the island, which is very, very out of description of England, I think. Yeah, and the United Kingdom. And, and what do you feel now is Russia's relationship with Magog? So because we were saying Russia was God, or Soviet Russia rather was God, and God set His face against it. And this was a prophecy, actually, and the second Khalifa said specifically that yeah. God will end the system. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this is not a prophecy that was made after communism fell. Yeah. This is in the book, The Economic System of Islam by Mirza Bashir al Din Mahmoud Ahmed, the second caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. He put this at the end of his book about the economic system and of wasn't Islam. Wasn't this published like in the 40s or something? Yeah, it was published in... You can, t- you can take it off. Uh... Yeah, it's fine. Um, so it's um, it was published in 1945. Right. Right, it's actually a speech delivered on February twenty sixth, nineteen forty five. Yeah. So that that just shows you the prescience because that was actually uh, that was at the end of World War Two. Mm. I mean, that that is a pretty. I never realized that actually. That was at the end of World War Two. So how well timed. You know, around that time, I, mean, I don't know if it was before or after the um, the Americans were considering uh, bombing the Soviets with a nuke. Yeah, and they were considering right. immediately switching to war. So I mean, communism was not. Uh, Soviet Russia had not become the behemoth that it would become. No, um, and uh, and uh, we saw its fate. So then the Russians' people essentially became, by default, almost became part of Magog, if you will. Yeah, well, because they adopted capitalism. Yeah, and this is what Dugan's warning is about, I think, to some extent. Or well, his is, sense. I think he has an sense. intuition that something is amiss. We have, we we haven't got re- a real alternative. And in that sense, the Ukraine war has actually done the Russians a massive favor, right? Because it is totally dispelled and broken for the Russian people hmm. the uh, obsession that they have had since the fall of communism to become Western. Right. I think they're still in the, in the rich cities of Moscow and uh, St. Petersburg, for example. There is still that sense hmm. that they are Western. Hmm. They're not Asian. Hmm. But in the rural areas, and from what I've read and what I've come across, it seems to me that there's a much greater revulsion yeah, for the West than there as ever has been, and they are now determinedly not Western. And the fact that Dugan, who is probably their top international public, I, I don't know what goes on domestically, but internationally he's the face of Russian for not philosophy. Yeah, and he is hyper anti-Western. Yeah, you know, says a lot. It does, right? It does. Um, so he is looking for an alternative, a fourth political project, uh, a fourth political theory, uh, which he tries to construct, but. Unless he understands that actually it is from Christianity that this uh, disease spread, the yeah. disease of atheism, if you will, yeah, um, then he will never actually be able to overcome it. And he himself is a great is a is a great proponent of Orthodox Christianity, and they wear it as a badge of pride. But it actually should should it should sh- send shivers down their spine. That's right. That the Christian that the West were exactly like this. Yeah. Who could have Who could have imagined you know current social trends in the West? 60, 70 years ago. Well, some people could have, but I mean, it wouldn't be the majority, right? No, exactly. You know, the, the church going Americans going every Sunday. Yeah. 
um, you know, even in the Simpsons made in the nineties, it was still a staple of the, of, I know. <laughs> of, of, of white slash yellow, uh, American culture. Um, so, you know, things have changed so much and they will f- suffer the same fate, uh, both culturally and economically as well. Yeah. Um, so why don't you talk about the economics first? So we'll go into, yes, let's talk about the economics, uh, briefly. We have, we have got a whole interview on this, um, called, um, something about Islamic finance, finance, Islamic economics, uh, with Tariq al Dawani. And there are a few tenets of it which are um, different, but the essential idea of it, and this is why you have to have a real um, ideology or belief system with a foundation um, in order to replace uh, liberalism, because Islam actually has a foundation in God. Yeah. And it says that God is the sovereign and everything belongs to God. Yeah. Ultimately, everything is is his to the extent that we belong to God. You know, yeah. when most when 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 someone dies, Muslim says, "Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajun." To him, do we belong, and to him shall we return. Yeah, we were never our own. Yeah, we are not our own. Yeah, we are God's, and uh, if we are to excavate anything, it is simply to uh, you know uh, expunge our own ego and realize that essence. Yeah, of belonging to God, and that's what Islam is: is submission to God. Yeah. So Islam has this idea that all the wealth of the earth and everything that one can produce wealth out of is belongs to God, and thus, which is self-evident. When you really, you didn't put it there. <laughs> I mean, you didn't. You, you didn't, didn't make it in the furnace of the stars. And you didn't create yourself, and you didn't create yourself to discover it. Yeah. You know, and were it not for the mercy of God, you wouldn't have even found it. Yeah. So literally, from root to branch, is God's belonging. Yeah. And as such, the Islamic philosophy is therefore it belongs to mankind as a as a whole. And and thus it should be employed for the good of mankind, but it doesn't endorse a communism because it, it respects private property as long as it's within the limits of being towards the common good. Yeah. Um, but if if private property is amassed or used in a way uh, to such an extent that it becomes anti-social, yeah, then the state, which becomes a de facto um, representative, representative in a in a in yeah in a, in, a, in a, yeah. Of the interests of the people. Yeah. Um, then they then the state has the has the ability to take that away. And that's manifested most clearly in the wealth tax of Islam, the, the zakat. So tell us about that. And it's, also its relationship with interest. So it's it's it's, it's anti interest. Yeah. So interest is about um, you have money, you get more money. You have debt, you go more in debt. Mm. Zakat is you have assets, you lose them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't have assets, you get them. Yeah. So it's a wealth tax which is funneled and directed. And taking not income, yeah, wealth, very important difference. Wealth which is unused. Wealth which is unused, exactly. It's not just people's wealth. It's if you're not using your wealth and their lies unused for more than a year, one fortieth of it each year. If it's above a certain threshold. Above a certain threshold, one fortieth of it must be circulated back to the poor. Hmm. And the idea is that as a result, you know, wealth is continually as rich people, as they accumulate wealth and they take it out of circulation by putting in expensive paintings, expensive houses, expensive cars, expensive yachts, then that money is actually disappears mm. into these sinkholes of wealth and tax state, havens. That's tax exactly havens. what happens. That's now. Exactly what happens. And what Islam seeks to do is take a proportion out each year from these, mm. so that they're circulated. And obviously, the consequence will be that if you're rich and you have a nice big yacht and you're yeah. going to have to pay one fortieth of its value, pretty much. Every single year, you're going to sell it. <laughs> you're going to sell it, and you're going to think, well, I need to make money from my money, so I'm going to invest it into society. Correct. Correct. Now, that investment is also a major part of how Islamic uh, banking works, which is that the um, engine of investment is equity finance. It is basically, I will give you money, and I will take a share in your company, in your and profits, in your profits. And your losses. Yeah, in your profits and your losses. And that's different from debt because... Well, because debt, you have to pay it back no matter what. Exactly. So it's not; it doesn't tie the investor's interests mm. to the interests of the society and of the company and of the person, mm. because they're going to make their money back, whatever. And that's exactly why the banking system has become so overinflated and dominant. Um, I mean, the banks literally now, at this point in Western history, they make up money. Yeah. Uh, they then give it to you at no cost to them, uh, and then you have to pay them back uh, with interest. And if you fail to do that, they'll they'll take your house. Yeah, <laughs> it's literally the biggest scam in, in human history. It's incredible. It is. It's literally making stuff up and saying, "Now give me real stuff." <laughs> yeah. So I've got this made-up stuff. Can you give me the real stuff? I I typed it. I typed it. Come on. <laughs> I mean, anyway. So we there is a necessity, therefore, for Russia 
hmm. to avoid the fate of the West, get back to Russia, it has to recognize the diagnosis. Yeah. And then it has to give a prescription which is going to cure that diagnosis, which is going to cure that disease. Now, the hmm. disease is Paulinism, hmm. which is the notion that man is disconnected from God's laws. Hmm. Now, you've got one of two choices. Either go to Judaism, hmm. which has kind of become a bit of a fossilized religion, I would say. Hmm. Or you would... Even, even, even in many ways by its own adherents, or those who call themselves Jewish. Yeah, well, because it, it still clings to this notion of the Jews as a special people. And I think that's probably the most anathema hmm. aspect of... Um, anathematizing aspect of... Why do I have to use words like anathematizing? It's probably... <laughs> Off-putting. <laughs> Off-putting. Yeah, it's probably one of the most kind of... Um, no kind of out of place in the modern day right. aspects of Judaism. The notion that the children of Jacob are very special. Yeah. And everybody else is <laughs> yeah. as special by definition. Unless One not picture. genetically tested to Palestinians. Yeah, unless the, uh, and if the Palestinians, definitely not. Definitely not, right? Yeah. Um, but Islam is a very different religion because Islam is a religion which recognizes the truth of all other religions. Mm. To be a Muslim, you have to believe Jesus was from God. So it's it's not local, it's universalist. Correct. Right. So it's, it believes Jew, Moses was from God. And in fact, the Quran says that there is no people to whom a warner or a prophet has not been sent. Even the Russians. Even the Russians. Right. right? That would be a real, really nice line to end the whole thing on. Even the Russians. <laughs> but no, we can continue. Um, so yeah, even the Russians, even the North Amer the American Indians, e um, Native Americans, I should say. The First Nation people in Canada. <laughs> Let's use all the PC terms. Um, even the uh, Australian Aborigines. Even the non-American Indians. Even the non-American <laughs> Indians. The Europeans. I mean, so... So the biggest and the greatest fulfillment of this perspective of a universalist Islam is in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Right. So the founder of our community, he emphasized this point um, as part of, and this is where we get to the eschatological prophecies of Islam, Yeah. which perhaps you can elaborate on in relation to the coming of the, the Mahdi. And if you want, I can read Dugan's Well, well what's that. so interesting is that, you know... Um, so really what I want you to cover is the universality of Islam Ahmadiyya. Hmm. And the eschatological view of Islam in relation to the rise of Christianity. Hmm. Go. <laughs> well, I, I will. I'm afraid I have to give a bit of preamble because I think no. um, uh, this really goes back to uh, how we know things. No, what this goes back to is is, is Dugan and how um, he he has a he has a strange sense of a coming transition and a finality towards liberalism. And he firmly believes that, that that modernity, as we've known it, as in Western liberalism, is coming to an end. And so he wrote this article, maybe we can bring it up, sure. about um, the rise of multipolarity. I of, have it. I think no. he called it six civilizations versus one, and how under BRICS, which is essentially a political alliance, one could say a geopolitical alliance, an economic alliance. Well, it's technically not an, it's not an alliance. It, it's explicitly not an alliance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's explicitly not an alliance. It explicitly is a trading block. Right, right. Or, but it, or it's, trading. But it's a meeting of, of so many different civilizations, as, as Dugan puts it, versus one. And I think he writes in this even now that one they may still be the, the most powerful. Um, but he then goes on to do something very strange in a way, which is he goes through all the um, uh, eschatologies or eschatologies. I don't know which is the right pronunciation. Um, but, but pronunciation is the correct pronunciation. Thank you. I, I, made to, I made sure I got that one. Good. Um, he went through all of them, which means the end time prophecies and end time, uh, uh, yeah, views of all of these different faiths. And he goes, he has this massive article which goes through all these different religions. Yeah. And for Dugan, this idea of time as being linear is something he associates with Western liberalism and modernity. This idea of progress and things always get better over time. He's interested in how different cultures cope with with time. And on that point, you know, Islam has an interesting. Um, in a way, it has two aspects to it, which is on the one hand in Surah Al-Asr, it says that, you know, man is in a, st by the time, by the passing of time, man is in a state of loss. So it does believe that time marches forward. And uh, as in an individual's life, one loses the opportunity to do good as time goes on. So use that time wisely. But also within Islamic philosophy is this idea of some, si um, of, of, of a cyclical nature of time in the sense that you have cycles of humanity, of prophethood, 7,000 year cycles whereby prophethood starts and then eventually ends. And in between you have these uh, mountains 
of uh, of prophets with the, with the, with the, with you know the greatest prophet we believe the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Um, so you have these cycles and you have eras of change and transition, eras of darkness followed by eras of light associated with the proximity and distance to a prophet. Yeah, and in the um, biblical to an extent, but more explicitly in Islamic philosophy. We are in a great transition period, which is that we are in the the end times. Yeah. We are entering the final millennium, the seventh millennium. We've entered it. We've entered the seventh millennium since Adam. Yeah. And who is not the first man according to Islam? Who is the first prophet? We believe that the earth has been around for about a billion years, and that the universe is approximately fourteen billion years old. Yeah, Continue. I think four billion years the earth. Four billion years. Yes, yes. Is that right? I, I might have made this up. Whatever. Few, well, so it's, roughly it's, what the geologists say. It's pretty long. It's, pretty, <laughs> it's been around for a while. Um, so, so when we say seven thousand years, we do not mean that we have only the planet Earth has just been here for seven thousand years. Okay, can everybody just relax? <laughs> okay. So right. believe that's one cycle within within the broader history of humanity. Yeah. Uh, and that we are in this final millennium, and that this was the prophesied time. Final millennium of this cycle, not of the universe. Right. No, I think. What we are in is now we're going to this final millennium yeah. uh, of humanity, yeah. and this final millennium is a time when uh, there is the prophesied um, fight, the great battle between the forces of evil and the forces of good. Yes. And this is remarkable because it is seen throughout so many religious cultures. In fact, every religious culture. Yeah. Um, you look at um, even I don't know if this was covered in um, in Dugan's article, but even in uh, Norse mythology. Mm. You have this uh, time when you'll have a great battle between good and evil, and you have all the hero, the, the heroes coming back, I believe. And after that, you'll have, uh, I think, a single man and a single woman is left, and they they repopulate the earth in an era of peace. Mm. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, you have um, even in their in, even in their religious culture, you have you know clear religious messages of Thor is clearly a prophet. Odin is clearly kind of the all father is, is clearly God. Loki is clearly Satan, you know, the trickster, the mischievous one who leads yeah. people astray. Yeah. Um, and in the Christian, uh, Christian belief, you have, um, uh, obviously Jesus coming back and, and the rapture and the rapture. And he goes on to talk about Islamic belief. And let's, let's go to what he said with regards to, um, his view. I just had it taken down. Oh, okay. What, so what, what so you, we put it back yeah, out. When you put, just read out. Yeah, yeah. Just you have to read it all. Maybe just read some of it and then summarize. It. Okay, fine. Let's go back to it if that's right. So he says it's Sunnism. So he covers Sunnism and, and Shiism. He says in Sunnism, the end of the world is not described in detail, and the visions of the coming leader of an Islamic community, the Mahdi, pale before the description of the last judgment that God Allah will administer at the end of time. Nevertheless, this figure is there and is described in some detail in the Hadith. It is about the emergence of a military and political leader of the Islamic world who, who will restore justice, order, and piety that had fallen into decay by the end of time. So, and he goes on to say that the Mahdi will defeat the Dajjal, the liar, mm. the empire of lies, mm. and establish Islamic rule. A peculiar version of Islamic eschatology is also professed by supporters of ISIS. Various figures in Islam have proclaimed the role of the Mahdi most recently, the head of the Turkish PMC, Sadat Adnan Danriverdi, proclaimed Erdogan the Mahdi. Erdogan. So what, what did he say about Ibn Arabi as well? Is that in there? Yeah, he did. So he says, I just skipped that out. But yeah, the authoritative Sufi Ibn Arabi, uh, Rahimahullah, um, specifies, he didn't write Dugan said that? Oh, okay. I just did that. Yeah. Uh, specifies that the Mahdi will be assisted in ruling by viziers, forming the basis of the eschatological government. And according to him, all viziers... Emirs. This, <laughs> emirs, yeah. All, all, all viziers of this metaphysical government as assistants and projections of the United, unified Pol Qutb will come from non-Arab Islamic communities. Very wow. interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Talked about the Jamaat. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Um, so the... Odedar, <laughs> the office holders are mentioned by Ibn Arabi. How strange. Uh, so, um, so, so, what do you make of this? Well, I find this very interesting because he is, uh, he's quoting, he's clearly got some knowledge on this and he's, he's been reading about this. Um, but he is correct in, in respect to some of the things that he said, which is that the, well, he, he has given a good characterization of the Sunni belief, but we would argue that the original Islamic belief, which is not represented well by the contemporary Sunni belief, correct. is that Jesus, peace be upon him, has died, has passed away. Yes. And thus the uh, prophecies by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and those by Jesus himself in the Bible about his second coming are metaphorical. Yeah. They don't mean literally Jesus is going to come back. Rather, Jesus is going to come back in the same way that Elijah came back. Elijah came back not physically from the heavens, but he came back in the spirit and person, uh, in the spirit and power 
um, uh, of Elijah in John the Baptist. Yeah. So, in so that, John the Baptist was a new person. Yeah. But born Jesus, of a woman, normal person. But Jesus said that this is the Elijah you have been waiting. Because when the Jews were waiting for a physical return of Elijah from several hundred years earlier, six hundred years earlier. Because he came in the spirit and power of right. Elijah rather than being a physical. So what's the underlying message there? And if you don't get it, I'll tell you. <laughs> Why don't you tell me? So so the underlying message there is that the Muslims will become like the Jews. Right. You don't need a Jesus mm. unless you have the same disease mm. in the sense, the moral disease. And that spiritual the, uh, the, 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 ailments. The spiritual ailments that the Jews had at the time of Jesus. Yeah. Which was? Uh, extremism. Yeah. Right. Politicization of their religion. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, literalism. Literalism. Not a uh, failure of morals, lack of morality, right? Um, and an obsession with national, with, with nationhood as the, as the principal expression of religiosity, mm. right? Where their religion became nationalized, mm. uh, became an express, became a national project. Yeah. Okay. Not a, not a spiritual project, but a material project hmm. that God was expected to deliver unto them political and economic rule. He's exactly said that. The Mahdi is there to restore justice, order, and piety, right? But he's also to be an emergent military and political leader of the Islamic world, Yeah, which is actually incorrect. Yeah. So the, a lot of the Hadith literature upon the Imam Mahdi are actually corrupted. Hmm. It's an example of how Muslims have used the original concept to... Um, politicize yeah. a religious figure. Why? Because in the in the few centuries after the Prophet's death, peace be upon him, they were trying to say that this person is Mahdi or this person will be from the family of the Mahdi and you know yes. they're trying to support their own little political leaders Correct. Uh, in their own times. Exactly. Uh, but the, the reliable hadith are uh, in a way sparse and they are telling us, but the ones that we do have that are reliable are quite explicit yes. in what they say about the Mahdi and the the Messiah. Yeah. You know, one of them, for instance, one of the famous ones says that there'll be no Mahdi, there'll be no guide leader except Jesus, peace be upon him. Yeah. But it, meanwhile, you know, another hadith. Well, that's in Ibn Majah, which is regarded as a weak narration by many Salafis in particular. Mm. But there's also one in... Um, well, it says in Bukhari that the Imam will come from among, among you. How will it be with you when the son of, Ma of Mary descends upon you and the imam will be from among you? Absolutely. And, also, and he will be the imam from among you is one reading of that. Absolutely. And for the Muslims anyway, in Musnad Ahmad, mm. there's also a clear narration which says... Is that that Bukhari Muslim? No, there's also one in Musnad Ahmad, okay. which uh, it's, it's clear, there's a clear narration that the, that the Messiah will himself be the Mahdi. So, um, the, 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 the... What's the upshot? The upshot is this, is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that the Muslims will become like the Jews of Jesus' time, as one shoe is equal to another shoe. Mm. Such that if a Jew had married, had committed adultery with his mother, mm. same, same, in the same way there will be one among my community, Ummah, who will do the same. Mm. In other words, the sins of the two communities would parallel each other. For just as Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the mirror of Moses, mm. and the, the, the greater manifestation of Moses, actually, mm. and he brought a greater law than Moses brought, Similarly, there would be a Messiah for him, Muhammad, as there was for Moses. Mm. And he would appear in exactly the same time frame in the, in the um, 13th century after the Prophet Muhammad as Jesus came 13 centuries after Moses. Mm. And the founder of that, and that individual was Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Yeah. So the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is that uh, eschatological movement mm. which was there which is there to conquer the the jal the great liar yeah right now what is that the what is that the great liar okay so well, he's referenced it in his article so let's just say what he said again he says he says he is there the mahdi will defeat the the jal the liar and establish islamic rule so the mahdi we believe is mirza ghulam ahmed was born in 1835 died in 1908 and he founded the ahmadiyya muslim community in 1889 and he said that the Dajjal, mm. what did he say was the Dajjal? He said it was Paulinism, specifically Pauline Christianity, mm. right? And that was an actual fact he identified. We haven't come up with this whole thing that Paulinism is, is the rot at the center of Western civilization. He said it, yeah. right? We're not inventing anything here. We're just telling you what he said, mm. okay? So he said that actually Paulinism is the rot which destroyed Judaism. Yeah. Jesus' Judaism as it was propagated, right? Yeah. Um, it didn't destroy it. What it meant, what I mean is it, it corrupted it mm. or sought to corrupt it. And then it destroyed the church 
And now it's been destroying Western civilization. Yeah. Okay. And that is the diagnosis which Dugan has to recognize. Mm. And so how he in particular defeated it, he defeated, the Mahdi defeated this in one of two ways. First of all, people always conceive of these religious metaphors as, mm. as a literal event, mm. as a boom, one person slays another. Yeah. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about who the Dajjal is in Islamic Hadith literature? What are the signs of the Dajjal? And then that will bolster our claim that it is. Paul I'd rather you do it because I want to find a famous vision of the of the of the Prophet where he explained the nature of the Dajjal. So if you can tell us that, and I'll find this. Okay, fine. So the the Dajjal, according to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, as he's correctly pointed out, the Dajjal means the great liar, hmm. and it means the one whose lies are overlapping like bricks, right? Such that a large wall is created, hmm. which is has hundreds of thousands of of lies. Hmm. which overlap each other and support each other. Okay. That's the meaning of the Dajjal. And it uh, originates actually from a, a, a word which actually refers to um, minting coins right. with false gold. Right. Okay? So you mint a coin and you, you th think it's gold, but actually it's false gold. Right. It's a bit like, it's mon it's a bit like monetary fraud. Yeah. Um, so and it's counterfeit truth. It's counterfeit truth, yeah. Which is what the church is. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so what you have, therefore, is the, the Jaliyat means the liar, and the, the signs of the, the Jal the Prophet Muhammad gave were extraordinary. So he said that the Jal will be a giant right. who will be blind in the right eye, but his left eye will be so piercing that he will be able to see the treasures of the earth and the, the, the resources of the earth. Mm. And he'll have a mountain of bread with him and a mountain of food. And those nations that subject, subject themselves to him Mm. He will send them the food. And those nations that do not subject themselves to him, he will withhold the food and bring about crises. That's sounding familiar. That sounds pretty familiar. Like sanctions. It? And yeah, sanctions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. And he said that, that the Jal, that civilization, this is that's what the giant means. It means a civilization. Oh, and he had Kafara on his head. He will have Kafara, Kafir, yeah. which means a disbeliever on his head, which just means that he will be an out and out. He yeah. won't be a Muslim. He won't. This is a non a non Muslim nation you're looking for, mm. and he said that the, well, the sign of the, the Jal will be his donkey. Yeah, and you think it's a bit weird, isn't it? There's a giant with a donkey in one eye. I mean, you know, what's going with this? But <laughs> bear with me. So the the the, the Jal, this liar, this lying giant, will have a donkey, mm. and the donkey will be so large that he will have one foot in the east and one foot in the west. Mm. And he will eat fire and breathe smoke. The donkey will make a month's journey on land into a day. Mm. And he'll be able to travel over water very fast. And he will be able to jump from one part of the earth to another part of the and, earth. And I think it, I think one of them talks about how it will run like the clouds. It will run like the clouds and have the moon on its forehead, mm. this donkey. So if you haven't got it yet, the donkey <laughs> is the internal combustion engine. And if you haven't got it yet, you should uh, and, probably go to sleep. <laughs> because if you didn't get that... Um, so the donkey is the mode of travel of the, the mode West. of travel. Yeah. And this is actually not just in the Hadith literature, it's in the Quran as well. For God says in the Quran that, the, um, that, the, that God will bring about modes of transportation of which you are yet unaware of. Yeah. Okay. And it also says in Surah Al-Takvir, which means the overthrowing, a wonderful chapter which gives all of the signs mm. of, the, of the modern day as the signs of the latter days, as the and, signs and you of the map. read that in uh, Revelation, Rationality, Knowledge and Truth, which has a... Uh... Maybe we can get that book up. Let's get that book up. No, well, I we... think let's, we don't want to digress too much. Into Fine. That, so basically, sh long and short of it is, is that the, the, the Jal, who he would slay, would be marked out by his mode of transportation, which would be such that he would eat fire and breathe smoke and travel fast over the land, sea and air. Very clearly, it's talking about modes of travel as the great sign mm. of that nation. And what does the right eye being blind and the left eye well, seeing right into the earth mean? Right signifies um, religion mm. in, in Islamic uh, prophecies and visions. And the left signifies the world. Mm. And so the right eye being blind means it will be a nation which will be spiritually blind, but its left eye will be so pure and excellent that it will be able to see the, na the treasures of the earth. It will mean they will be driven by resource accumulation. Yeah, fossil fuels, etc. Fossil fuels and gold and minerals etc so it's a perfect description of western imperialism yeah uh specifically because the and western culture as well and western culture is not i wouldn't say all aspects of western culture specifically christianity i would say and um, it's and it's child atheism and it's child atheism because the question is where do we get christianity from in that story the jal is a term which means the great liar and in the holy quran 
the greatest lie that is stated, it says this is the greatest lie. The heaven, yeah. such a lie that would render the heavens, that would tear the heavens apart, right, and render the earth beneath our feet, is the idea that God has a son. Hmm. Okay, that is described in Surah Al Maryam, in Surah Al Kaf, as such a lie that it would rend the the actual fabric of nature. And it is a lie which actually. Uh which destroyed the fabric of Western society and Western belief in God. Yeah. Because the irrational nature of Trinity and the corrupted Bible put people off the Bible and Christianity so thoroughly that they went off all religion. Yeah. And they became completely atheistic and they became, you know, they had this new religion of freedom, which they took up instead. Yeah. So it is a lie which has destroyed the spiritual uh, quality of the West. Completely. Um, and you know, I you know, I know you mentioned this earlier, but I want to uh, I want to give you some of the words of the founder of the Ahmadi Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, and what he said about the Dajjal. And this was in 1893. This was his, in his book of Revelations, which he compiled. And he said uh, in his accounts of them, he said, "I beseeched, or oh, that was compiled after his death, actually, I think. I beseeched Allah the High and threw myself before Him, desiring that the mystery of descent might be resolved." And that the true interpretation of the Antichrist might be revealed so that I should know it with the certainty of knowledge and should see it with the certainty of sight. His favor then to turn towards my, my instruction, my understanding, and it was revealed to me. I was taught, and I'll go on a bit. He said, he spoke about the Antichrist, he said, as to the Antichrist, now listen, I will explain to you the reality on the basis of the clear and pure revelation that I have received. Then understand, my dear ones, that it has been disclosed to me that the reference to the Antichrist, the Dajjal, the great liar, as one individual, is not designed to indicate his personal individuality, but his unity as a species, meaning thereby that in that species there will be a unity of ideas as is indeed indicated by the word Dajjal itself. And in this name there are many signs for those who reflect. The meaning of the word Dajjal is a chain of deceptive ideas, the links of which are so attached to each other as if it was a structure of equal sized bricks of the same color, quality and strength. That's where I got that from. Okay. Some of them firmly overlapping others and further strengthened by being plastered on the outside. So it's an edifice of lies built on lies. An empire, one would say, of lies. <laughs> yes, as a, as a recent, recent Russian description of the West uh, had it. I thought it. it was highly, highly, highly it's apt. Very, very apt. So, I mean, this is, the, um, this is the great disorder that all of these prophets of different eras warned about. And they said that there would be the spiritual battle. And they tended to say that they, i.e. their pro them as a prophet, would come back in the latter days. Yep. And this is what um, it's exactly what Dugan is getting at, which is that, you know, he spoke about the Kalki avatar, the final avatar. That Did will... he speak about the Kalki avatar? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. So he goes through how there'll be, you know... The... Good on you, man. I know. <laughs> people, oh, yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the final, you know, the final um, manifestation of, uh, of Krishna will come. And uh, I think he goes through Buddha as well. And all of these religions prophesy the, the the second coming or you know the arrival of of someone else in their form, um, or many of them at least, who will fight this final spiritual battle. And we believe that Islam is that final religion for all people and for all times. And thus, the one who was to come would come within Islam. He would be a prophet that would be a representative of all of these previous prophets, because he himself is a reflection of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who is the master prophet. That's right. And this is how we see Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the founder of the Ahmadi Muslim community, who lived from 1835 to 1908. Yeah. And he didn't claim to have a new law, a new sharia, didn't come with a new Quran or anything like that. He came as a spiritual reflection of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and one who would fight the manifestation of Satan as it had fully manifested in civilization and cultural form by the uh, 19th and then the 20th century. And that he was there to fight it, and he did fight and it. And what was the nature of that fight? It was a spiritual battle. So it, what are the weapons? Prayer. Prayer, that's right. So people often, you know, they mistake these, these prophecies because they speak of battle. You know, even the is prophecy of Ezekiel about communism is about, I will put the jaw, their hooks into their jaws, and I will hmm. come with an army and I'll decimate. These are metaphors that speak to um, the spiritual battle that occurs. 
And the meaning of battle actually is deeper than a physical battle. Yeah. Physical battle is one uh, outer representation of, of, of a conflict which is deeper. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's a very good point. Um, and, and the greatest proof that this people, a lot of people say, oh, Ahmadis, everything's metaphorical to you, right? Hmm. But it's not true. Um, yeah. Death of well, Jesus is pretty literal in the Quran. Death of Jesus is pretty literal in the Quran. Um, and, and we're going to go through one. No, that, that was metaphorical. <laughs> 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 so, so the um, the they were going through one prophecy of the promised Messiah, the founder of our community, about Russia mm. in particular, which is fulfilled to the T, two eighty. Um, and the the key point I want to highlight is that the weapon of prayer um, is actually mentioned in the Hadith literature that when Jesus comes, mm. um, God will tell him, "Do not, I have created two nations which no people can can contest, Gog and Magog." So don't even try to contest them. Don't try and fight them. But pray and your prayers will melt them as salt dissolves in water. Hmm. Right? So this is in the hadith of Sahih Muslim. Um, and I can bring that up. That's okay. I think we... I think, we, uh, I think we'll find that comment yeah. later or we can, uh, people can look for it. So it's a very famous hadith about the coming of the Messiah. And it's, a long, it's the long one in Sahih Muslim. And it states, it states this thing that actually the, the method of the coming of the Messiah... Hmm. is explicitly, do not fight them. Hmm. God actually tells the Messiah when he comes, do not fight them you, and pray and your prayer will melt them as salt is dissolved in water. Because okay. they're the fighters. They're the ones who cause this disorder in the world. Exactly. So, so you know, Muslims, as he's, he's talked about the Sunni view, which is to come and be a military and political leader, is directly contrary to what the Prophet Muhammad actually said. And the Prophet Muhammad actually said that he would come and he would establish the abolition of of the necessity for war. Mm. Yada ul harb is what he said in Sahih Bukhari, mm. right? So in actual fact, this is- He would stop war. He would stop war, mm. right? He would stop war. So this is the true meaning of the Messiah and the founder of our community was that individual. If we can get a picture at some point of the founder of our community, I can do we that can now. put him up. I can do that now. Uh, but you wanted to talk about one prophecy which is particularly relevant to, um, to the Russians, uh, which talked about the Tsar. But it was a prophecy which he made, I believe, in 1905 originally, in the form of a, of a poem. So this is Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the uh, founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. said 1835 to 1908. Correct. And it's now the single biggest uh, united Muslim community in the world. This, you know, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, he made uh, a, a shocking prophecy about a um, great, great calamity or earthquake which would take place. And he wrote a poem about it. Yeah. And why don't you tell us a little bit, we'd have to go through the whole poem, but some of the, some of the highlights of it. And, um, I would like to go through the poem. I think it's a pretty important poem. Okay. <laughs> so he, he basically in, I'll, maybe you can zoom, maybe you can bring it up again, please. Um, so this is eight, April 15th, 1905. Can you see it? Yeah. Is it big enough? I think it's big enough, isn't it? Yeah. I saw in my dream last night that there was a severe earthquake which seemed more terrible than the last one. And then, then he writes, the next day he writes this poem. He says, a sign will appear sometime from now. Today is April 15th, 1905, which will overwhelm villages, towns, and meadows. The wrath of God will bring about a revolution in mankind. The naked one will have no time to fasten his trousers. Suddenly a calamity, calamity literally earthquake, will severely shake them all, be they humans, trees, rocks, or oceans. In the twinkling of an eye, the land will be turned upside down and streams of blood will flow like the water of a rivulet. Those whose night garments were white as jasmine will be in the morning as if clad in red like the sycamore tree. Men shall lose their senses and birds their consciousness and nightingales and pigeons will forget their song. Hmm. That hour will bear heavily upon every traveler and wayfarers will lose their way in confusion and delirium. With the blood of the dead, the running waters of the highland streams will turn red like bistort syrup. The terror of it will exhaust everyone, great and small, and even the Tsar at that hour will be in a pitiable state. Let's read that again. The terror of it will exhaust everyone, great and small, and even the Tsar at that hour will be in a pitiable state. That divine sign will be a specimen of terror. The sky will attack with a drawn hatchet. Hasten not to repudiate this, thou undiscerning fool, for my truthfulness depends entirely on the fulfillment of this sign. This is a prophecy based on divine revelation and will doubtlessly be fulfilled. Wait then a while in righteousness and steadfastness. And he states, is a note appended to it. He said, divine revelation has repeatedly employed the word earthquake in this context and has indicated that the earthquake will indeed be an example of the judgment day. 
However, it should be termed earthquake of judgment. I'm not able to apply the word earthquake with certainty upon its actual manifestation. It is possible that it may not be a common earthquake, but some other dire calamity, which would be an example of judgment day, the like of which has not been witnessed before. Hmm. Very important. And which would bring about great destruction of life and property. If no such extraordinary sign appears while people have not openly reformed their way of life, I shall in such case have been proven false. I mean, wow. So just going through that, that prophecy, he said it will happen fast. What, and he goes on to say that it would happen within 16 years of 1905. So he's saying an unprecedented world calamity is going to happen within 16 years of 1905, yeah. in which the Tsar of Russia will be and that a was based, state. that was based, as far as I understand, on his, uh, because he thought it would be in his lifetime, and that was the upper limit of how long he would live. But it is remarkable that even though he was then told it wouldn't be during your lifetime, Correct. it was still fulfilled in that time frame. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So he was then told a, prophecy, a prayer in 1906, which is, oh, Lord, oh, oh my Lord, do not let me see the earthquake of the judgment day. Hmm. So he was taught a prayer to pray not to see it. Because it's such a terrible thing that it would affect him. Presumably, God wanted to spare him seeing such a calamity affect mankind for whom he had prayed so mm. fervently in his life, for whom he cared so deeply. So, but all of the features of this are clearly about World War One. Mm. He says it's he says it's not certainly an earthquake. Earthquakes don't affect the whole world. Yeah. He said it'll, it'll affect everyone. Yeah, it'll be unprecedented, never happened before. Mm. Right. So it'll be the first of its kind. It happened fast. He said it began, he began say he began by saying it'll happen fast. The wrath of God will bring a revolution in mankind, such that the naked one will have no time to fasten his trousers. Suddenly, a calamity will severely shake them all, right? And then he goes, blood will flow like uh, rivers. Okay, can we just pause there? I mean, famously, World War One happened in, in a rapid fashion, in a totally unexpected fashion. Yeah, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, and boom, Europe was in war. Yeah, um, within a, within a few days, mm. right? Um, in the twinkling of an eye, the land will be turned upside down. So that's referring to trench warfare. The land will be turned upside down. Mm. And out of its streams, will blood will flow like the water of a rivulet. That's, that's the Somme, mm. to a T. And that was actually seen, literally, in some towns as well. And that was seen, for example, in particularly Gallipoli. Mm. You know, the Gallipoli the description of what happened at Gallipoli um, to the British soldiers was that they said that the, the blood of, of, the, of the shoreline, the, the, the sea, was red for a uh, hundred meters out or a hundred yards out. I can't remember the, the, the literal word for word description, but imagine how much water there is in, in an ocean, in a sea, in a seashore, mm. the, 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 the metric tons of water that's there for it to have been made red up to a hundred yards, even or a hundred meters out is, you know, is an extraordinary thing. And he says, men shall lose their senses, you know, shell shock, Mm. was the first time, you know, you basically, PTSD was born in World War I mm. it, from its perspective of this kind of, as a syndrome, yeah. as a diagnosis. Um, and birds, their consciousness, nightingales and pigeons will forget their song. This is literally like... And that literally happened. I mean, there's that uh, wonderful piece of work by Bilal Daher in Review of Religions. Yeah. Um, a wonderful uh, publication, which everyone should um, should have a look. It was founded by the, the founder of the Ahmadimus community himself. Yeah. Uh, so reviewofreligions.org. And has an article where it actually documents how this literally happened. Birds did literally forget their songs, and there yeah. was um, some chaos within some migrations of. Uh, I mean, I was <clears throat> I spent a long time trying to find a, a poem by an English poet who'd been in World War One, um, who wrote a poem about the the birds forgetting their song hmm. that I'd read when I was in school, and I could not find it, and songs annoyed me. <laughs> yeah, but but even you know English poets have even written about how the effect on bird life that, that the trench warfare had. It goes on to say that the travelers will be affected, the blood of the dead, the running waters of highland streams will turn red. And Famously, then travel you know travel pathways and by ocean in particular were particularly destroyed. massively yeah. destroyed, yeah. Um, and then the key point, he says, is that the terror of it will exhaust everyone, great and small, and even the Tsar at that hour will be in a pitiable state. And he goes on to say this, that divine sign will be a specimen of terror. The sky will attack with a drawn sword. Mm. which is exactly the first time you saw aerial warfare was yeah. World War One. Mm. So all aspects, and then he says, do not hasten to repudiate this o undiscerning fool. Yeah. Um, for a, my truthfulness depends entirely on the fulfillment of this sign. So a worldwide calamity which will cause a revolution and the Tsar will be in a pitiable state. How was, how was I mean, that's particularly, that's relevant in every aspect to Russia and the Russian experience. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Well, the Tsar was, you know, a pitiable state is a is a perfect description because it wasn't just that it doesn't refer to it doesn't say 
Nicholas the Nicholas the second, right? I think it was, yeah. Tsar Nicholas II, yeah. It doesn't say him by name. It refers to his station. Mm. And so it refers to the institution. Mm. That's a good point. And the institution was removed from office with yeah. the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And, and the prophecy was made in 1905. Correct. When, when the Tsar was, uh, you know, still relatively pretty secure and he was actually enormously wealthy. Yeah, and he was extremely loved. Even at the beginning of World War I, mm. the Tsar was extraordinarily well loved in 1914. Mm. So the, the 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 his downfall was very sudden, very unexpected. Mm. You know, so people say, "Oh well, you know," and you can, you can prophesy against the Tsar. It's not just the Tsar; it's the Tsar in the context of every other aspect of this prophecy. And in 1905, the Tsar was the greatest uh, ruler of a landed empire over the l- largest area, possibly that the world had ever seen. Yeah, right. Um, because the size of Russia and the size of the the Tsar's um, authority. So. And then what happened is he was, you know, taken from power. He was put under state arrest in a nice stately home. And then he was increasingly put into more and more confined and difficult circumstances and homes. And then eventually his children were basically by Bolshevik, you know, guards under instruction from the Bolshevik government. They just took him and his family and they executed them. And the, the story of how they were executed is, uh, is, it was written by one of the guards. So we have in detail all of the features of the pitiable state. You see, and that's also a part of the fulfillment of this. Because we know exactly what happened to them, mm. right? And it's harrowing. It's actually harrowing. It's harrowing. It? It's absolutely harrowing. I mean, anybody can read it. You know, it's uh, they tried to kill the little girls, mm. and the little girls had they had diamonds sewn into their dress mm. to uh, maybe just because that's that was their wealth. Maybe it was on purpose. So the bullet, bullets, most a lot of the bullets ricocheted off them. Mm. In which case, the guards had to go and stab them mm. with their bayonets. Little girls, young mm. women. Mm. Right, he had four daughters, I think. Uh, three or four daughters, because very, very, very harrowing, definitely in a pitiable state. Mm. Okay. Um, and we know about it. That's also an aspect of the prophecy I haven't appreciated before, which is that if we had just found out that the Tsar had died and been executed and there was no written record yeah. of how he died and what happened, we couldn't say that this was I think fulfilled. that record was found later, but I can't remember. Well, yeah. Whether it was or not, when it was found is irrelevant. We have it now. Yeah. Um, so this is specifically relevant for Russia. And I would say it's you know, possibly it's very difficult to say which is his greatest prophecy because each one you go through them in life and you're like, oh, this is actually his best prophecy. And then a year later, you're like, oh, this one's his best prophecy because everyone is such extraordinary, so extraordinary. But this one was marked out as a particular sign of his truth upon yeah. which his truth relied. Yeah, uh, and it and it referred to one of the greatest and most calamitous events in human history. Yeah, possibly the especially because it, it, it itself gave birth to the Second World War in a way. You could say they're kind of part of the they're same war in a way. It's part one, part two. Um, so this is a, something which I think is, is a sign for the Russians as well. And the Russians now, as they stand now, and as Dugan represents, are looking for that fourth political theory. They are looking for the way out of becoming Western and uh, uh, an antidote to Western. Not becoming Western, way out of following the path of the West. Right. The, 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 they need an antidote to, to, this, uh, to this civilization because their own civilization, which they historically had, uh, in Soviet Russia has now fallen. So what are they to become? In the interim, they've come become more Orthodox Christian, but maybe they even see the writing on the wall that this this won't last forever. And they need to find something else. And what we are saying is that Islam and Islam Ahmadiyya in particular is that something else. Yeah. It is both universalist and it allows for national pride and national progress. Yeah. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said famously that love of one's nation is part of your faith. Yeah. And Islam is very patriotic. You know, because it's it's just another way of serving your neighbor at the end of the day. Yeah. It's serving those around you and those to whom you have a, a link, mm. be it through your tongue or or ethnicity or anything else or through your common practices and values. So, I mean, Islam is that answer that Dugan and others are looking for. And uh, I think it's it's high time the uh, the Russians came came to to true spirituality. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, you know, the founder of our uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, he he he. You might want to say, well, how did he slay the Dajjal? So how did he slay the Dajjal? The biggest way he did it is he, or one of the most obvious ways you can say he did it, was that he showed in his book, Jesus in India, that um, Jesus did not die on the cross. Hmm. So he attacked Paul's central foundational principle on which he based the entire destruction of the Judaic law and the notion that a law given by God is a curse not to be followed. Hmm. Right. So he did that by addressing the central core tenet, which is that Jesus died on the cross. And he said, actually, 
if you see somebody walking around after an assassination attempt, yeah. bearing the wounds of the assassination attempt, saying, I am not a ghost, yeah. feel my wounds here and here, for I, a ghost does not have blood and flesh as I have. Do you have any fish, by the way? I'm pretty <laughs> hungry, right? If somebody does that to you, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed said, what it tells you is that the man survived the crucifixion attempt. Mm. He survived the assassination attempt. Mm. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's such a, it's a self-evident statement that if you were to see somebody after an assassination attempt, it means they didn't die. Mm. You don't suddenly think to if somebody's after an assassination attempt. You go, you go. Did he die and come back alive? <laughs> <laughs> That's not the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is. He survived. Especially because he prophesied that he would survive as Jonah survived. You know, uh, that was his great sign, the sign of Jonah. And Jonah, Jonah survived incredibly adverse situations. So what being, did Jesus say about Jonah? He said, he said, my sign is that, you, you know, you, you said, no, sign. You, no sign shall be shown to a wicked generation except the sign of Jonah. Right. Yeah. So, and the sign of Jonah, which is that when he should have died by being thrown into the sea, he was saved in a miraculous way through, by being swallowed in the belly of a well. Yeah. And Jesus, peace be upon him, similarly survived when he should have died. Yeah. So that was the sign of Jonah. Yeah. But if you say that he died and came back to life, you've contradicted the sign of Jonah, and thus Jesus is not true. Yeah. It's a it's a tight it's a tight fit. Hmm. So it's uh, so by showing that Jesus, in actual fact, survived the crucifixion, he migrated to the east to find his the lost tribes of Israel hmm. who were scattered over the east, and he went so far as to even demonstrate where the tomb of Jesus is mm. in Kashmir and he identified it, and you can still visit the tomb of Jesus mm. if the Indian government will let you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it's there. Folks, and there's a, there's a BBC documentary on a BBC it, documentary which we showed on actually in one of our and previous videos. the BBC are extremely authoritative and uh, never tell a lie. <laughs> so it must be true. Well, they uh, have video documentary footage of it and yeah, the people the, there. The, so. no, actually, actually, that BBC documentary I think is... Uh, is was a really fantastic job, and we we even interviewed the director, if you remember, mm. um, of that BBC documentary. Um, if the BBC have done bad work, this is great work. So um, definitely check it out. It's on YouTube, though we do not advocate um, watching pirated documentaries. Um, so try and find the original. Uh, well, I think we used, but our... you will struggle. <laughs> I mean, promise you that <laughs> it's well, on YouTube. Just watch it on YouTube. Well, we yeah. used we showed it in one of our videos under fair use. Um, yes, we did. That's true. So one can watch that. Yeah. So you're saying that, you know, the, the Russians are clinging at the moment to the Orthodox Church. Yeah. But Jesus has been shown to have died. Yes. Exactly. By the founder of the Ahmadi Muslim community. Survi not on crucifixion. Yeah. Survived crucifixion. So, died a natural death. Died rather, a natural death. As a much later being. in a different place. Which just completely cuts the legs of the idea that he's the son of God. And thus, if, if Russia, and thus Russia will be ill-fated if they stick to Correct. Christianity and some progressive atheism in their, in their major cities. Yeah. They will, they will inevitably suffer the same decline that yeah. the West has suffered. Yeah. Um, so Dugan and any other Russian philosophers and any other ordinary Russians, if they're looking for something else, look towards Islam Ahmadiyya in particular, yeah. uh, which has exactly what they want. Yeah. It has that middle way. And even in the economic sphere, I mean, you know, why don't you explain in terms of you know, Dugan has identified interest as a major issue, but I still don't think he understands why per se. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then BRICS is also thought to be going to be creating its own currency, the equivalent of, you know, Keynes's bank call, mm. you know, or fulfillment of it. Um, so the question is, what's that going to be tied to? And people are saying a basket of commodities and certainly gold is going to be one as of them. As long as they have interest but anywhere, the anywhere exactly. within their system, their system will unravel exactly as the Western system unraveled. Why? Because interest, again, is a universal asset in the economic sphere. It will slowly dilute and destroy everything that comes before it. Because once you accept the idea that a commodity can have a receipt, but that receipt can be replicated without the replication of the commodity, you have created an inflationary system. And you have delinked your currency, i.e. your receipt, from the base asset. Because as the base asset grows like this, the receipts grow like this. And that is essentially what has happened to the Western system to the point where that mismatch became so great yep. that Nixon said, well, let's, let's, let's do away with the fast wall together. And let's just, let's just agree that we're going off receipts. Yeah. Now. Because France sent its gunships to, to America to demand its, to gold, its back gold because back. they were like, you're just printing money yeah. for the Vietnam war. But that, that is something which is, which, which is inevitable. Well, that was the origin, the origin of Western banking in, uh, you know, in London and in, I think in the Dutch banks and stuff 
is um is is this is this process of too many receipts yeah. um and that is what interest is that's what riba is yeah it's, interest de- demands hmm. that you find you print more receipts year on year hmm. without the commodity the base asset increasing hmm. it demands it hmm. right and especially when you create the money as debt hmm. right it's not like debt is a yeah then the receipts giver can can issue debt at will and demand it back even though they don't have the rece- the uh, the assets to back it up. Yeah, so, so Russia is going to go it enslaves them. Absolutely. So Russian currency system is going to go exactly the same trajectory. Yeah, and um, they may try and mitigate it by having a, um, a basket. basket of commodities, etc. It doesn't joining. matter what the commodity is. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the commodity is because it's not the commodity that it's matters. The, it's the that currency. That you, you can have a, you can have a currency based on oil, but if it was actually based on a on a one to one conversion, it could still work. Yeah. Right. But if you have any commodity based on any current on any any currency based on any commodity, but you allow for receipts and currency to be multiplied, which interest demands, yes. because interest says time creates money. Yeah. So as time goes on, you have to give me more money. Where are you can get that money from? Oh, I'm gonna have to get some more receipts, even though the actual thing hasn't changed. So the banks have to print more. The banks have to print more year and year. And this is what we spoke to at length with Tarek al Yeah. A wonderful interview. And we are hoping, God willing, to do another one at some point, if he'll let us. <laughs> I don't think he will. <laughs> He's trying to stay out of the limelight. Um, um, not that we're in much limelight. But. No, <laughs> we're in that very hot light. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is an inevitable process and bricks will unravel financially unless they do something different. Yeah. But they are basically, the, the, whole, the whole bricks thing is we're going to join together and do what the West did. Yeah. Uh, but against the West, yeah, you know, we're going to be Christian, but against their atheism, even though they were Christian, we're going to have a commodity currency against their uh, fiat currency, even though they were commodity currencies. You can have the same fate, yeah. And without, and and most fundamentally, without real spiritual and religious law that regulates your people and your um, social culture, yeah, then your quality of governance will decline in the same way. You will end up in the same moral trappings. And you will have the same issues. Yeah, you are not special. This is something which every nation needs to learn. Yeah, you you are not fundamentally, you know, special or different. We are all humans, and we all have one God. And the only salvation we ever have is submission to that one God through His laws. The Russian experience will be no different. The Chinese experience will be no different to the Western experience if they go down the same path. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Alrighty. Well, I think that preamble was done. Um, right. So, so when are you going to get into it? <laughs> <laughs> pretty soon um thank you very much for watching. do we have any comments we need to cover i mean you know let me wrap up this video and then we'll do that all right thank you very much for watching uh this video please check out our many social medias on twitter on facebook on sorry on x on facebook <laughs> <laughs> on instagram on uh tiktok um and uh subscribe uh make sure you like and give us some comments below particularly if you're in russian Even if you post in Russian, uh, we will use Google Translate and hope that's good enough and try and reply to you. But for now, thank you so much for watching. And finally, the last thing that we want to say is that Alexander Dugan, if you do want to come onto the show and uh, discuss some of the ideas, we would be um, we'd be very happy to to talk further with you about uh, the contents of today and anything else that you wanted to discuss. Peace be upon you. Peace be on you.